club wise, I don't have too much to tell you. I think I, I've put out on the net our 220 repeater. Finally, it went to a hard failure. So we've got the old standby uh, in there now, and the uh, the repeaters back to the uh, manufacturer for service. And uh, so we'll look forward to getting it back. Um, I think I've re reported that our, we re totally rebuilt our Echolink with a new radio and software and so forth. And so our Echolink station's been running real well. Uh, so I understand. Uh, I think everything else is uh, operating, to my knowledge, uh, equipment-wise. So uh, I hope everybody uh, made it. <clears throat> through the uh, snowstorm we had about uh, best we could tell about 15 inches here in Westminster um, we had some drifts that were over three foot we had a lot of wind but uh, everybody probably experienced the same thing so I think we got somewhere around 15 inches of snow um, anyway any questions club wise for me before we uh, proceed on with the program uh, if you looks like pretty much everybody's muted, so if you haven't, please uh, please do that so we don't get the the background noise. So uh, with that, Jerry, we are re we are recording now. Okay, we're recording already. So I will uh, uh, turn it over to uh, to Steve WD8 DAS and uh, Steve. Uh, we normally plan on an hour hour and fifteen minutes. I don't know what you had uh, what you had planned for time, but uh, uh, so we don't wear everybody out. Uh, uh, something in that order would be great. And then have a period for questions and all. Uh, but anyway, please tell us a bit about yourself. And uh, uh, I know you've worked in broadcast a lot. And, and I'll just turn it over to you. And uh, you can run with it. We do very much appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this for us. So go right ahead, sir. Glad to. I'm glad to. I'm Steve, Steve Johnston, Johnston WDATAS. I was uh, what, 13 years old, maybe 1970. My novice ticket, big part of all these years, and uh, still is a dumb fact. I guess my big news lately is I bought a, a ham radio related business. Uh, AF4K Crystals, a maker of vintage crystals. Uh, I bought that a uh, few weeks back and brought all the inventory to my house. And now I've got thousands and thousands of crystals. <laughs> so if you need any, your ore is adjusted. No, 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 not that kind of crystal. But anyways, uh, so I didn't want that service to, uh, to go away. The fellow who owned it, he had died. So I... Uh, took over that operation and hopefully I can continue to supply those to people who want them for their vintage rigs. That sounds like a commercial and I didn't really mean to do that, <laughs> but it's, it's a big thing for me right now. So I'm kind of excited about it, but tonight I'd like to talk to you a little bit about radio noise. Um, the presentation that I have to offer, uh, I guess I got to figure out how to share my screen here with you. So far I haven't, uh, seen how that's done in this particular meeting. Usually a host has to enable it for the... Um, so if you go to the... Uh, click the present now if you see it in the lower right-hand corner. Oh, there it is. Yeah, go ahead. And then select. Usually your screen, there's there's several flavors there that you can choose, but usually yeah, it's your get it going here. Thanks for the tip. So there we go. That looks promising. And we're seeing your screen now. Nice, but I need to see it is the problem. A little sluggish here. Sorry about the delay. I can hear my CPU fan going up to higher speeds, so hopefully I can uh, put this old computer to its full potential here tonight. Maybe I'll try the other option of sharing. 
I usually have to stop presenting and go back in to do that. Yeah. There we go. Try that option. Are you seeing the uh, PowerPoint? Yeah, it looks great. All right, cool. Thanks. Well, the problem of radio noise, that is indeed what it is, and it's one of my banes uh, that I've been fighting for many years, and it only seems to be getting worse as we uh, move along here through the years. A little bit about these topics. Uh, who's being impacted by this radio users of all kinds, I uh, can summarize it uh, in that way. Um, these services are losing coverage, be it your Wi-Fi in your house to get through to your devices or uh, an HF operator trying to hear a DX station that would normally just be above the noise, but gee whiz, your noise just climbed higher. Uh, talk about where do you find this interference and that's sort of the uh, idea of locating the noise sources. And indeed, if you locate them, then you can eliminate them in many cases. When is it happening? All the time and getting worse as time passes. And does it really matter? I hope uh, most everybody that probably uh, in radio club is going to have a feeling that radio noise matter. So in my experience, radio hobbyists are this issue. People who are uh, trying to do unusual things or straying the limits of radio usage um, are going to have come up against this limitation of the, the, the noise in their local environment, option of the desired signals. But the general public, completely unaware, uh, Unfortunately, a lot of engineers and technicians are too, and I can say that uh, there's also a problem with manufacturers in general about either not being aware of this as an important issue or, in fact, deliberately not caring and just choosing cost over quality in this case. Career as a broadcast engineer, I ended up fielding... Uh, listener complaints about interference to their reception. And it took a lot of different forms, but I can say in general, it's getting worse. And that's a, it's sort of a good measure of it. Um, at Wisconsin Public Radio, the place I was most recently director of engineering, uh, we actually tracked the uh, listener comments and feedback and complaints and inquiries and, and tabulated that information and I could analyze it. And I did find some interesting uh, Stays there, but the main point, I guess, is that in fact, over a five-year period, we'd heard from more people than ever before to to a point that we had forty percent more complaints related to just reception in general. Now, admittedly, a little bit of that could have been number of some the FM band. There were new stations being built in the non-commercial band, but. By far, it was simply noise. And I can I can tell stories over and over of how I help people resolve their noise problems. I'll give you a quick example. I had a listener who was in visual sight of our ocean transmitter site here in Madison, Wisconsin. She actually could see what we called the candelabra tower, or our, uh, the FM that she wanted to hear was there. And she'd had good reception for decades, no problem. She wants to hear it on her kitchen radio, but she said she couldn't anymore. And I asked her, did anything change in your house? Did anything new get installed? She said, I got a new microwave. I said, well, that wouldn't interfere, would it? You know, unless you were running it. It is a radio transmitter after all, but it's on, you know, like 2.4 gig. Um, but I said, can you unplug it easily? Is it is it just sitting on the counter? Can you unplug it? She unplugged it. And over the phone, I could hear her reception come back of our flagship station. I said, plug it in again. Give it a few moments to sort of boot up and then boop. So it had a spurious emission right on top of the desired station she wanted to hear. She returned it to the store 
and got another one of the same type, and it did exactly the same thing. So it was a manufacturing defect. It was a really strong spurious output, but of course it was coupled very close to her receiver too. And finally she went with a different manufacturer and model. So this idea of that someone would say, I used to get good reception, but not anymore. It was a, it was a true thing, and, and many, many people were running into that problem. And I think as hams, we certainly uh, fight that same fight. And in the case of a lot of listeners, they don't care about the real causes or anything, but they want to hear what they want to hear. So... This limited awareness that sort of hurts the, I don't know, the propagation of the information, maybe you would say. Um, I think a lot of people have an understanding that AM broadcast is somewhat more susceptible to noise interference. Um, but it really affects everything. And I'll go on in this presentation to show you some issues on VHF that are pretty serious. But uh, people will say, well, I'll just listen to FM or I'll, you know, use uh, digital services or something like that. Well, a rising noise floor bothers all of it. It doesn't matter. It's just an on AM and HF particularly. Sideband is really. But what I'm getting at is, is that you might use a modulation technique that hides it. You might use a, uh, an advanced uh, algorithm to pick out a signal below the noise, but in all cases, more noise is bad. And you also see this with the new uh, digital television is each, uh, or each version of the digital television has come into play. That It's been sort of a fight between the desire for people to use indoor antennas and the amount of noise that's inside people's homes. So it's sort of an arms race of technology trying to fight the noise or, or work within that noise problem because a lot of people don't want to put up outdoor antennas. So I mentioned uh, I did some studies of VHF work. Uh, this was in the FM broadcast band, but it would apply, I think, pretty widely. I, I did check to see that these effects were present in uh, the uh, VHF two-way radio band, the high band, above two meters. So it would apply certainly in the two-meter band. 440, I hear noise problems all the time. So what I did was I took a look at the situation in these three different locations, a suburban house, an urban apartment building, and office building. And I studied how was the noise outside the house or the building as opposed to inside the building. I took a little portable, portable spectrum analyzer with a loop antenna. The antenna is not meant to be resonant. It's just sort of a probe. And, uh, you know, the, the levels, the signal levels are arbitrary in this case. But what we're looking at is the comparison of noise to desired signals. That's a picture of my house. I took it as an example of a, a home that actually has been policed for noise <laughs> ever since I've lived here. It, I, uh, my family will see me walking around with a portable radio trying to find the new noise source and somebody's plugged in a new cell phone charger or something. So here was the signal situation for the FM broadcast band outside my own home in Fitchburg, Wisconsin. you got lots of big signals there, standing up tall and proud. Middle of the FM band here, there we have a station on uh, 98.1, I believe it was, is that uh, it puts a good signal into my neighborhood. But you can see that in among these signals, there is some noise, and not an insignificant amount of noise. And any station below that level is going to have a struggle to be heard in this location. So I took the equipment, no change in the calibration, no change in anything, and walked inside. And I came into this same room that I'm in here now, the office area of the house. And that was the situation. A lot more noise and some attenuation of the desired signals. Now I can uh, rock back and forth between these two images. You can compare. This is outdoors. 
in the driveway, out sort of by the street, and there's inside the house. All these stations that are below this noise floor are going to be difficult to receive, certainly. Maybe more likely impossible. Now, that's in this particular. I could find a better part of the house. I could maybe find a worse spot. But this was just it's right inside the door, or the front door. So you can see there's a pretty serious issue. And this is a house where I have done significant work at trying to prevent noise problems. Here's an apartment building in Madison, more of an urban setting. A very strange name of the building. It's called the Quiz. It used to be called the Quisling Apartments. Quislings are uh, traders in Norway, but that's off the topic. So I stood outside on the sidewalk and took a measurement. You can see the signals are distributed a little differently in terms of signal strength because we're in a different geographical location. But it's the same, pretty much the same lineup. But there are more signals, I think, standing out tall and proud here, but probably more stations are aiming to serve the downtown area. But then I step inside that apartment building. I didn't go inside anyone's apartment, but there was sort of a, a hallway that ran along in front of the apartments. And that was the situation. A lot more noise inside. Here's outdoors on the sidewalk. Here's indoors. So you can see there's challenges. And as I say again, this would these this is a wide band problem. This is not limited to the FM band. But that was a convenient thing for me to to study and, and easy to uh, have a, plenty of good signals, you know, the desired signals to compare to. Um, the headquarters of Wisconsin Public Radio and Wisconsin Public Television, for that matter, an ur urban office building on a university campus. You can see plenty of good signals standing up tall and proud on the analyzer display. This is outside on the sidewalk there and uh, that, by that traffic uh, intersection. Now I'll step inside, and I believe I was in the lobby of our facility, up on the, uh, on the seventh floor. Look at that. Now you can tell two things are happening here. One is the building has attenuated a lot of the signals. You don't have the desired signal standing up tall and proud, but you've got healthy noise all over everything. So this was sort of the worst case scenario where you have shielding of blocking the desired signals, probably due to the metal frame and uh, other construction elements of the building. And lots of uh, sort of wild and woolly noisemakers running inside this building. Why do you think this is happening? Well, I expected it was about a lot of the consumer devices as well as some of the professional things that you might find in an office, but just that general idea of electronics for the people, not any particular devices, but just in general. There's a lot of them that are making noise these days. I think uh, switching power supplies have become nearly ubiquitous. They're every, in a television set you buy today has a switching power supply. Every computer you buy has a switching power supply. Your laptop computer's charger power supply is a switching power supply. And why do I care about the switching power supplies? Well, they are more noise prone. The earlier designs of, of power supplies that are known as linear supplies do not use this uh, slicing up of the of a and and high speed switching action to get away without having a heavy transformer. So they have advances advantages in efficiency and weight. You notice probably that wall wart power supplies don't weigh nearly as much as they used to. Well, that's because they're switching supplies instead of linear supplies. But switching power supplies have to be designed to suppress the noise that they naturally produce. Whenever you switch a signal with a sharp on-off, you, you're creating wideband noise. You attach wires to that, like all these power supplies have an AC cord and the DC side. You d attach those wires, now it can radiate it. Or it can be conducted to another device plugged in. Well, I, I think I should mention, too, that the uh, 
engineer is the manufacturing engineer. I talked to three guys. You know, that's not a, a real scientific study, but they all three of them expressed concern for the fact that they design their products with consideration of the RF uh, noise making potential. They put in filtering components, they design shielding. However, what they told me was that when the their design is picked apart or criticized, uh, critiqued might be a better word, uh, to get the costs down, those portions of the design are sometimes eliminated. And I think worst of all, they said that when they send the devices to China for manufacturing, and that was they all three said that's what their company does, they do not manufacture in the United States. When they send the design away, the actual products that come back sometimes are missing those parts. They're not really, you know, the, and I've seen it. I've opened up pieces of equipment and on the circuit board are places for the AC filter components, but they're not there. There's jumpers in places of the chokes and there's nothing in the place where the capacitors would be. And uh, finally, uh, one of the guys pointed out that he had uh, specified in his design that the plastic case around the device that he was uh, designing would be coated on the inside with shielding paint. I guess it's paint that has maybe a metallic content and uh, that he could get a shielding action without having to have a metal case by using that paint. But the manufacturer in China just found an ordinary paint that had the same color. So there was no shielding in the product anymore. When he pointed out these discrepancies, uh, his management was a, was not interested. So his device, you know, he was sort of, when he was talking to me about it anyway, sort of disappointed that uh, his device might be making more noise than it should. So why would you search for sources of radio noise? Well, as hams, I think we would want to eliminate noise sources. Certainly, we'd want to find them if they're in our own home. I know here at my house, a lot of my antennas are above the house, or in the cases of the longer uh, dipoles, inverted Vs, and so on, they're sort of straddling the house. So any noise source in the house is going to be coupled into my receive systems pretty, pretty easily. And so I have to try to keep the noise level under control. I might extend that to my neighbors. I might expend it, extend it to the overall neighborhood. But here's an interesting fact. Uh, studies were done, actual scientific studies, not my kind of anecdotal stuff, in Europe that showed from day to night as the propagation changed, the noise floor changed, and it reflected the urban areas that were just sort of like glowing with noise. If you could see radio waves, these urban areas were glowing with noise. And then when propagation allowed it, that noise was actually strong enough to be propagated into other parts of the continent <laughs> to raise the noise floor elsewhere. And they worked out the geometry of that and they could say, okay, here's the noise from Frankfurt and it's landing over here in uh, Belgrade or something. I'm just making that, I'm making those cities up. But that was uh, what they found. So it's getting to the point where it's pretty significant problem when it's that loud, the noise from a whole city. But I think on a more uh, practical level for individuals, uh, we simply want to keep the overall noise floor inside our premises and in their surroundings, coupling to our antennas as low as they can possibly be so that our RF equipment works as well as it can. Well, you could spend, you know, $6,000, 8000 $10,000 and get uh, field strength meters like these and make measurements and get absolute numbers on things. Um, particularly the one on the right gives you a good nulling effect with the uh, loop antenna in the lid. And you can really, really pinpoint the angle that a signal is coming from by nulling it out and taking a bearing. But that's not necessary for this challenge. That <laughs> These are the deluxe ways of doing things. A $5 radio from the thrift store will do the trick pretty nicely. I found that this one is a good choice, this Motorola, because it has an extra long bar antenna on the inside, the ferrite antenna, and it gives me a nice sharp null off the ends that's good for pointing. And so when I null the, desire, the noise that I'm chasing, I can just see the, you know, along the line of the radio's housing, which direction it's in. And it's going to be in either end. You can't discern with this setup, this discern the actual heading. But, you, you know, you have the two possibilities of 180 degrees apart. 
walk uh, a little bit off to the side and take another bearing, and now you know where that is. And here's uh, you know the example I was using with a portable spectrum analyzer and maybe a handheld directional antenna. This antenna is a wideband antenna, log periodic style. That would work for VHF, UHF stuff. Uh, a cheap version of that I found for tracking noise is a uh, corner reflector, the TV style for UHF television. That's lightweight, reasonably small. But again, that's not necessary. But if you want to get serious, that's the way to do it. Or like I did, if you're looking inside your own home, you might connect a, a little loop to a receiving device. You know, if you've got a spectrum analyzer, hooray. Uh, it's only by luck that I have a battery-powered spectrum analyzer. Um, but you could connect that to a receiver. And portable shortwave receivers are now very inexpensive. On Amazon, I bought several recently that are DSP-based portables that uh, actually have pretty serious performance for 30 bucks, 50 bucks. So that's not too bad. So how to use these? Here I am just demonstrating, you know, bringing that radio up in proximity to this computer that I'm using right now here on the desk. And uh, as I bring the radio closer to the noise source, it gets louder. It's sort of obvious. Uh, actually, I modified that radio to turn off the uh, automatic volume control action so I can hear it a little better, but it didn't make that much difference. It was clear either way. So it's simply the closer you are, the stronger it is. So that helps you find a source of noise. And that computer right there does spray out noise. It's all relative how much. I considered it okay. But if you bring it up close, bring that radio up close, you're going to hear some noise. If you're out in the field, not inside a house, you could do this idea of triangulation. As I said, you take a bearing on the signal over here. You walk down the street, take another bearing. Maybe come over here and take another one. Now you've pinpointed where that noise source might be. And this is an example of sort of a large scale proximity versus strength down the street. Folks that have a uh, mobile HF station in their vehicle have an advantage. Uh, I used to live in Idaho, and we were installing the bend over our line in several neighborhoods and I drove through those with all the station and could the dash bands as I drove by each of the pedestals where the equipment was mounted for that service the noise would peak up and then as I drove further down the street so here you see someone drove along and they were logging you know and they're just hearing it normal noise oh, it gets a little stronger really strong and as they pass the signal source it fades away again, that it's in roughly this general area. Now you can zero in with the other techniques. A map and make an estimate even of, you know, what part of a neighborhood a problem might be in, maybe in a building. So that's specifically a 1971 Motorola <laughs> I'm not trying to sell that radio, but you get the idea that, uh, you know, that's going to be something you could find at a garage sale. Uh, here in this image, you can see that it has a little longer bar antenna. I think that's an advantage. Oh, yeah, I did write about the changing the AGC. I think one of the best tricks, though, for determining a noise source, the starting point is simply to turn off the main breaker in your house while you listen to a battery-powered receiver. So if your HF rig can run on 12 volts, hook it up to a 12-volt battery. It doesn't need much current for receive, usually. And just listen to your favorite band where you're getting a noise problem and turn off the main breaker in your house. You'd be surprised how many people don't want to do this. Hams don't want to determine if the noise is in their own home powered by the AC. If you turn the main breaker off and you don't hear the noise anymore, if it goes away, it's something in your own home. And to, to guys over the years, and they'll say, well, it's got to be power lines outside the house. No, make try this. Just try it. 
Well, I'll have to read some clocks. Gee whiz, man. complain on the, you know, I talk to them on the air every day and they complain about the noise every day. <laughs> Let's try this. And then if you know that it's in your house, you can do something about it more easily than anywhere else. Maybe it isn't in your house. You know, there's, it's certainly possible, but I find it often is. The noise source is in your own home. A lot of electronics today are on all the time. What you do when you push the power button is just wake them up to their normal operating condition. But they actually are running. That power supply, that switching power supply is fully or partially operational. And you can see here some examples. A cable box that was, when it was turned on, was drawing 28 watts. And when it was supposedly off, was still drawing 26 watts. <laughs> so it was clearly just sort of muted. The video output was muted. There wasn't any, uh, it wasn't really off. So it's going to make noise all the time. You would have to unplug that from the power to determine if it's the noise source or not. Here's an Apple MacBook charger, kind of an older style. So you can make a comparison. When the uh, it's running the computer, not charging the battery, it's making... Uh, 27 watts, so it's still doing a lot of work, and uh, power supply is a significant player. Now, I will say Apple products I found to be pretty pretty well noise suppressed, so I give them credit for that. The washing machine. You would think when a washing machine is off, it's off, but not this one. It's just asleep. So here's an example of a phone charger that made intense radio interference. Even when it wasn't connected to the cell phone, it wasn't doing any work, no current being drawn. And this thing was, was screaming with radio noise on HF. Only when I unplugged it from the AC socket did that device go silent. But then I knew which one it was. I've talked to a lot of broadcast listeners who have their cell phone charging right beside their radio. <laughs> so I'll say, well, you don't not get the reception you used to. Have you added in anything? Well, and they don't even consider it as, as something to be worried about. And I'll ask, I'll say, is your cell phone maybe set up right there? Maybe you go to bed, listen to your bedside radio, and you've got the cell phone charging right there. You're really coupling that very closely into the receiver and its antenna. So. But I've seen uh, problems uh, sort of analogous to this in the case of a ham station where guys have equipment uh, sort of mixed in with their, their ham gear. They have other stuff that are noisemakers. So it's uh, something to consider, a little bit like my anecdotal story about the kitchen with the microwave that made tremendous interference on a particular FM band frequency. I think that was really exaggerated by the fact that her radio was very close to that device. So there's a, an example of a microwave. It's not meant to be an indictment of this particular model, but tells that story. This is the greatest name of a television set I have ever seen. Broke Sonic. <laughs> and it was broke. It made so much noise. So I finally, I did try to filter it. I did some other stuff. My, this was in my son's room some years back. And uh, I finally just put it in the trash. Uh, noise sources in uh, automobiles too, cars and trucks. This is an image of a guy using a portable radio with headphones to uh, search around for possible noise sources in his mobile rig. The only uh, critique I would offer of this photo is to be very careful with the uh, headphone cord as you get around the fan in the engine compartment. On automobile antennas, uh, a lot of times the grounding of the antenna is a big problem because then you, you're going to start picking up noise on the outside of the antenna cable. So something to consider. I think if uh, that was a ham antenna, you would not have good uh, match for transmit if that was the problem, but never say never. It might be. So it's worth considering, you know, that the, the uh, antenna 
ground is well bonded to the to the chassis of the vehicle at the antenna. It does seem to make a difference in noise pickup. Now, this was uh, in our offices uh, at WPR. This was a power supply and a, a piece of equipment shielded. It's in a metal case. It looks like it's pretty professionally done. But I had to add bypass capacitors on both the in input and output to uh, get it to be quiet enough that it wasn't bothering the receivers and people's offices nearby. I for a computer monitor. Very noisy one that I uh, took out of a service. I substituted another one of the same voltage and at least same current capacity. Sometimes you'll want to cut off the connector because it's an interesting connector that uh, you can't find or your AC adapter does not have. And so you can splice it on, be aware of the polarity. Most of these devices do show the polarity with a little graphic on the label. So if the, the tip is positive or negative, you can see it from that graphic, and then you know how it's currently hooked up and can adapt accordingly, whatever your supply is that you're substituting. Uh, network modems, routers, things like that have been particularly troublesome in people's houses because the noise that they create that rides as a common mode signal on the Ethernet cables that they're attached to them, which ends up spreading noise all over the house or an office if it's a business. Here's an example in a photo of a router supply that I had um, that was really making a lot of noise when I first hooked it up. So I substituted a linear non-switching type power supply that I bought at a thrift shop. This was a Toshiba brand uh, notebook computer that was making a lot of noise. Substituted a linear supply in its place. Um, let's see, you guys are in Colorado, right? Okay, so maybe this isn't a thing anymore, but indoor gardening enthusiasts have a great interest in high power grow lights and the lighting ballast power supply that was provided for that purpose is a notorious noisemaker. I think the ARRL actually got involved with this particular make and model, but uh, folks who are uh, growing plants indoors may be using something like this. Might be not in your house, but in a neighbor's house. If it's in your house, well, that's perfectly fine. And finally, the one that everyone thinks it is, the power company and those battle power lines. And it often is. <laughs> I've noticed a decrease in uh, maintenance being done on the power lines. Here we have a connector that is has failed and it's got an arc being pulled across it, which is sort of continuing the circuit in a sense, and uh, maybe actually we're still running equipment. But the problem is that that's, you remember the old timers used a spark transmitter or even an arc transmitter? That's what that is, and it's gonna make tremendous noise. Now, you personally can't get up there and fix that or shouldn't. Maybe you could imagine how you would do it, but you're going to need to cut off that power. So let the power company do that. And power companies vary a lot in their willingness to address uh, noise complaints. But if they have a complaint where something is flaming, maybe they'll be more inclined to come out. So to summarize, I guess it comes down to this. We're in a wireless world. And as much as people sort of pretend it isn't so, wireless means radio. <laughs> wireless systems all use radio. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G, all that. That's wireless. And noise is going to impact those modern systems just like they do what some people would consider more antique systems like amateur radio or or broadcasting. All of these things are uh, using the radio spectrum to try and communicate, and noise does nothing to help that. It only hurts. So I appreciate uh, your attention this evening, and I'd be glad to field any questions or comments or stories that uh, about what your experiences have been.
Harold, with a few comments. Please, go right ahead. The wave oven story was interesting. I'm looking at section 15.103 of CC rules and a digital device utilized exclusively in an appliance, example, microwave oven, dishwasher, et cetera, is exempt from the uh, uh, radiation requirements. So that's what happened there. That's wild, isn't it? Yeah. Same thing for a digital Why? device used. <laughs> I don't know. Same thing for a digital Lobby. device utilized exclusively Lobbyist. in any transportation vehicle. Uh, so there's cars also. Well, that means you could actually put maybe a 30 watt broadcast exciter in your car and have a quarter wave on the FM band and have a mobile broadcast station if there's no limit. Yeah, these these are, uh, th those exemptions are for unintentional radiators. Oh. And I think that transmitter would be intentional. Yeah, doggone it, I swear. And then um, your, your thing of, of turning off the main power and then, you know, if the noise is coming from your house, going around unplugging things till you find it, yeah. I think is extremely valuable. Uh, from that, I found that the uh, charger for my handheld radio creates RF noise, and also a power over ethernet supply uh, does the same. So I just have to leave those off when I'm running HF. And uh, finally- Are they close to your uh, shack or are they elsewhere uh, further away? They were, they were uh, in the same room. Yeah, I think that exaggerates the effect. Maybe even coupling it right through the power line, maybe not actually radiating. Yeah, the uh, one with the handheld radio was interesting in that I uh, would connect the outside antenna to it. And if I disconnected that, it was not picked up by my HF radio. But that uh, uh, going out to the outside VHF, UHF antenna carried it on out. Yeah. So the power supply is acting like a little noise transmitter, but you're attaching a lengthy run of cable, which acts like a, a beautiful antenna to spray it all over the place. That's, that's right. And then um, also um, at my website, w6iwi.org, I've got a section on power line noise and my experiences here. Excel Energy was extremely cooperative in Good. finding the problems and fixing them. Um, but there are things like, you know, is the noise synchronized with the power line? Look at it on a scope and so on. I'll tell you yeah. if it is power line noise. Any rigs with a, a spectral display or an SDR setup that you can look at the spectral display, you can see that pattern and it helps you make a guess. But a lot of switching supplies will make similar kinds of, to some degree. They yeah, it's like still it's, it's power line uh, power line related noise. Yeah, that's right. it. The, the, um, let's see. There was as I've moved around oh. the country, I've I've found that a lot of uh, electrical utility companies are interested. I didn't mean to to uh, broadly paint a, the whole industry with that brush, but it's the ones that just ignore the complaints that is sort of stand out in my mind. <laughs> I've had, as a broadcast engineer, had whole neighborhoods where people said, man, I just, I can hardly hear anything. And I go drive over there and yeah, sure, it's power noise. Look, it's peaking every so many feet down this power line. So it's like there's a standing wave for the noise on the power line. And uh, it's amazing to me that uh, these, I would contact the company on a, in a professional sense, you know, not just you know, Joe guy in his house, but you know, I'm representing a group of people who are having trouble and uh, it would be difficult in those cases with these companies to find anyone who even knew what I was talking about. I yeah. Uh, again, Excel was very good. Um, there's an ARRL form uh, for Colorado uh, where ARRL first looks at um, your description of the noise and that you have turned off your house power and so on. Then they submit it to Excel if it looks good to them. And they sent a tech out and I rode around with that tech for several days finding the problems. Madison Gas and Electric, a uh, kind of a cooperative of the old days that's turned into a corporation now um, that serves power in this area. 
they're also pretty conscientious about it. I had a crackling noise that was driving me crazy. And I actually went out in the dark of night with my uh, portable radio and uh, prowled around and I could see it peeking in different parts of the yards between the houses and so on. I realized that's where the underground utilities were running. And so I actually, I could, you know, I knew where the transformer was up on the top of the hill behind the houses here and the underground feeders to each house kind of fanned out from that point. And I went up there and it was really loud right by the transmit transformer rather. And, uh, so I contacted them. They were out the very next day. They understood what I was talking about. Didn't brush me off. And they found a cracked insulator on the uh, high voltage side of that transformer that was periodically sparking. Yeah, around here also, the uh, stuff for de-icing the roads gets thrown up into the air. It lands on insulators and then they start arcing. Also, they set poles on fire. Yeah. One time I changed my terminology and I told the, the utility that they had power leaks. Because that was an older term where they were actually losing energy to those conductive paths. And they came out and solved a problem in one neighborhood because I pursued it from that angle, that they were losing money. And again, that also set things on fire. So they were interested. Steve, you mentioned when you talked about the hydroponic grows in the ballast so that it, it might not be an issue out here in Colorado. It, it is an issue because we have both legalized medical and recreational marijuana, and a lot of people now are growing herbs and various other plants. So there's a lot of hydroponic growing going on in Colorado. Well, that's a good point. I guess I assumed it wouldn't need to be surreptitious, but if you want to do it all year long or at an accelerated growth pace, yeah. Or in the case One thing of I marijuana, you can't have it out in the open. You've got to do it indoors. Oh, interesting. In your basement, I yeah. see. I see. One thing I read about that is that they typically are a cycle of 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So you can tell mm -hmm. if it's that by logging your noise. That's a good point. Yeah, the plants, I guess, are expecting that cycle. Yeah. You didn't talk a lot about LED lighting. Uh, Steve, do you have any thoughts on The early LED lights were awful. They were as bad as the compact fluorescence, but they it's been my experience anyways, and, and sort of anecdotally from colleagues and other people I've talked to around the country, the newer LEDs are less prone to making noise. Um, I, and the ones that I have found that made noise were also visibly uh, flickering and seemed to be in some sort of partial failure mode. So... Yeah, I've got a there's another, with, uh, I'm sorry. There, there's I've another seen thing. Some on, shop on, uh, <laughs> the delay gets us on the on the what? the uh, shop lights that have LED uh, arrays in them. I've been very skittish of, but I just ordered some from Amazon, and they'll be arriving pretty soon. Um, so I can see the little markings on all these crystals I bought. I need more light, I've and uh, we'll see. Then. I've got a situation just developed recently. We have a, a, a smart home system in our house that uses uh, X10 switches. And for years, uh, I've had no problem. And then we replaced some bulbs with LEDs and they were fine for a long time without any issue. And now suddenly one of these X10 switches is acting up because apparently the LED doesn't provide sufficient load for it. So I've got to change it out now. Yeah. I've also heard that there's a problem where the, even when something's off, there's enough current that still flows the, and it gets a diode action that can cause some noise. Um, even when the uh, device is supposed to be off, it isn't really. Uh, the old smart home things, I think maybe had relays inside. So it was really pretty cut and dried, but I'm sure now it's a solid state, a triac or something that's doing the switching. So just like a light dimmer can be notorious for making uh, interference. Uh, so too uh, motion sensor lights, for example, that use not a relay, but rather this um, solid state switching. They can be. I have several motion sensors on lights in the other parts of the house here 
uh, you know, it's my duty as a father over the years to to say I'm not made of money. You turn off the lights when you leave the room. <laughs> so I put it in motion sensors, and then I had a bunch of noise, and I had to put on line-rated bypass caps across it to settle it down. On uh, LED lights and various things like that, uh, these digital devices, and uh, the lights are considered to be digital devices, there are class A rated devices and class B. And class B is for residential use and they have a much tighter uh, noise requirement. Yet you go to Home Depot or something like that and they'll sell you a class A device because it costs less. So that can be something. Look at the label, make sure you're getting a class B device. Yeah, uh, they also, should be made better, yeah. Yeah, a, um, another common thing for uh, noise in houses, uh, I discovered in high school, my brother's aquarium would jam the radio, and that was the arcing thermostat. Um, <laughs> also, doorbell transformers, they have an overheat thermostat in them, and if they start overheating, they'll jam your radio. Uh, also, a fairly common source of house fires are doorbell transformers. <laughs> so I guess those, those things don't work quite right. <laughs> Quick, yeah. Two quick points. One, you've got two people that have raised their hands to haven't been able to get in, and so I'm going to stick mine in to the third person. Uh, sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot. I have fun with the soda bean twister light classics sitting here. It's amazing how much noise that sucker puts out. Oh. This is a 20 meter version, but it's amazing how much you can uh, if it's close to your radio. And I will now put out my hand and have a Hudson and a Cedric Cron that have been trying to do it. Hi, guys. Hudson Miller. Um, I appreciate your uh, presentation. Steve. really enjoyed it. Um, so I, I know uh, we, what devices are causing noise. And I went on to Amazon and bought a Steve of ferrite uh, beads and loaded up the, the cord as close to the power supply as I could. Uh, didn't do anything. So then I started looping the cord through those ferrites, didn't do anything. So the question is, what do I do now, right? It, uh, are the ferrites that I'm buying from Amazon no good, or do I just need to go out and find some other different power supply for that device? Well, not all ferrite well, products are created equal. Um, the, material the material that they're made of responds, responds to different frequency bands. Band. So let's say I'm just making this up, but let's imagine that your noise problem was on HF, but the ferrite uh, beads or clamp on uh, filter devices had a ferrite product inside that was optimized for VHF. They might not have any effect on HF. So that's one possibility. Um, the other is, is that the propagation mode isn't what you're expecting. Maybe, the noise is actually on an inner conductor of a shielded cable, and it's actually the device that it's connecting to that's the radiating point. So when you put a choke on the outside of a shielded cable, you're only choking the stuff on the outside of the cable. I thought I had to mute you. We were getting some echo. You'll have to open your mic if you want to talk again. Sorry. Uh, so in that case, I'd need to switch to a linear power supply? Well, by far, that's been my best experience, you know. Okay, and and are they still available for sale, or is that something you just have to? Yeah, I think uh, they're very hard to get compared to what they used to be. But um, I think Jameco Electronics in California may still have them for retail sale. Jameco, J A A M E C O. At least they did pretty recently. Um, but my normal source is uh, thrift shops, where sometimes you'll find a bin of AC adapters. And I'll just poke through there. And let's say I'm looking for one that makes 15 volts at uh, half an amp. You know, if I find one that does 15 volts and uh, at one amp, that'll be all right. You know, as long as the current capability is higher. Um, there is a consideration, though. Sometimes devices are expecting a regulated, a constant voltage. And some linear supplies are kind of wild uh, free running devices that with no load make 20 volts and with load of a certain level, they make the desired 15. But if you overload them beyond that, now they're sagging down to 10 volts. So there, it takes a little know-how. I'd use a voltmeter to watch my results as I connect them up. 
it's an experimental thing. I, I guess there is some caution involved, but I take it so seriously that I'm willing to risk it <laughs> to, uh, to get to the bottom of it. And if nothing else, I can temporarily substitute my bench power supply and adjustable supply, which is regulated thoroughly. And, uh, you know, make sure the device runs properly at whatever the voltage I, I expected I was going to need to supply and make sure the current is what I thought it was going to be. And then also note there wasn't any interference. Or if there still was interference, I mean, the device itself could be making it not the power supply, but by far my experience has been the power supplies or the culprits. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And then the I, the second question was, is my antenna is immediately above my living room with all of these um, devices that are in fact causing my problem. <clears throat> is there some sort of insulation or shielding fabric material or something that I can to, to put underneath my antenna platform that uh, that would sort of reflect or absorb that? Yeah, I suppose it might be possible. Foil-backed insulation or something in, in an attic space maybe, but that's an awful big job. Uh, are there any other options for a location of the antenna? I've started to put antennas more toward in my backyard away from the house to some distance. From other people. Yeah. All right. I, I think you have a question. Um, so time again, and I'll give the time to the other folks. So thank you. Hudson, this is Jerry. I'm going to for the company called Aaron Corporation. Yeah, to the Michelle Paraita. As far as uh, getting uh, the right uh, mixture of the ferrite, I think you're into some proof in there. It's AMI Glam Corporation. Fairrite is another company, Fair Dash Right, R I T E. F A I R, I think, Dash R I T E. Great, both of those companies those. would present it in a way that it's pretty sensible and understandable. You know, they'll say that this mix of materials will work across this frequency range and another mix will work on this frequency range. And they, and they also, I think both sell ready-made products for these jobs, uh, clamp-ons. Steve, I can't see who has their hand raised on my side. You'll have to see it on your side. I think somebody said Cedric had his hand up. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Your PowerPoint presentation, will that be made available? I'd like to get a hard copy and print it out. Well, I can certainly uh, give you a copy. Uh, I have it in a PDF form as well that might be easy to work with. That, that's fine. Yeah, if you want to send me an email, uh, I'll reply with that in it. Um, WDAS at ARRL.net is... One Wait of the minute. many addresses. <laughs> say, say that again. I didn't catch that. All right. It's my call sign. Whiskey Delta 8 Delta Alpha Sierra. At ARL.net. Yep. Anybody who wants it, send me an email. That's one way. I believe I have it posted on my website, which is WD8DAS.net. There's a section there for presentations, and there's a group of things that are more broadcast engineering oriented and then some things that are ham oriented okay second question i have i live in an apartment and i got noise all over oh, it's hf i i bought a small portable hand hand carry radio killed the entire power to the entire apartment and I'm still getting the same amount of noise. Yeah. Well, but aren't you, you're sort of surrounded by other apartments probably. Yes. And uh, you're boxed in by noise sources. And at least in my own experience, even less cooperative than <laughs> house neighbors. But um, that's a tough spot. Um, I would try to get antennas out on a balcony or, you know, out on a patio or something like that to get them outside. I, a lot of apartment kind of setups I've been around had the stucco with metal back in the walls or or foil backed insulation or something and that was some shielding between indoors and outdoors so if you can put an antenna 
outside the building, even a short distance, it might help. Okay, uh, I'm working on that. Yeah, I, 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 it makes my heart hurt a little bit to imagine being a ham in an apartment. That's tough. Okay, I think that there was some other question, and now I can't remember what it was. So, um, yeah, I'll send you an email and uh, yeah. request a copy. Yeah, if you think of the question, don't hesitate to ask. And Cedric, I found the presentation on uh, Steve's site and dropped the link in the chat there if you'd like to get it there. Okay, where's the chat here? To the right, I think. Up at the top on mine. A little message. Oh. Works. I also see Bill has raised a hand. Yeah, I'm not seeing a display for the hands, so I don't know. Go for it. Had to unmute there. Uh, are the power supplies that are normally sold through HRO and other places like that that you need to power your radios, are they necessarily switching power supplies or linear? Well, they can be either kind, um, although the latest ones tend to be switching power supplies. But they have been designed with this in mind. If you hooked a uh, Chinese switching power supply that you bought on eBay or something to your rig, it might run the rig all right, but I bet you it would make so much noise it would be unusable. So the, the power supply, switching power supply is not evil. It's a great design, but you have to consider the fact when they're designing it. And so they, uh, like I have a couple of the MFJ kind of small, compact, but quite capable power supplies. I found them to be noise free. I saw a couple of them that did have noise coming out on on particular frequencies, probably a pattern of harmonics from the switching frequency. And uh, they actually had a switch on the power supply. Maybe it was on the inside of the device to offset them. If that happened to fall on a desired signal, uh, you could offset the uh, interference. That sounds a little bit like putting a Band-Aid on the problem, but uh, that was another approach. But yeah, I... I think you'll find that it you can go either way. A linear supply to run 20 amps is pretty heavy. 12 mm -hmm. volts, 13.8 at 20 amps is pretty heavy. Um, you'd need both hands probably to pick it up. The switching supply equivalent, where well, you could pick it up with one hand, maybe with a couple fingers. So manufacturers like it too because it's lower cost. They can have a higher margin. So I found yeah, that yeah. the Samlex, the Samlex supplies seem yeah. to be real. Good. I've used yeah. mostly those. I've heard nothing but good things about those. Yeah. Well, I've found that those wall wart power supplies over the last ten years have become are all are all of a sudden very noisy. And we, where I work, we use them in an environment where we don't want any RF noise, and it's getting harder and harder to find those power supplies. Yeah, I bought them all. That's the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I do. I do kind of hoard them when I find a good one, though. But you know, uh, I think that we may end up building supplies. I I've dealt with it in other ways. I had uh, a number of things that my son wanted to charge, you know, and he needed USB power for them. And the individual chargers that had a USB jack on them that he was using were very noisy. So what I did was I actually built a, built a regulated linear supply that made five volts and I put it out onto USB connectors. And so he had sort of a charging station for all things that use a USB cord. Well, what? But you do have to use the right cord for some devices like Apple devices expect a certain resistance between the data pins before it will actually accept the charge. Yeah. Well, our solution has just been to generate 12 or whatever volts we need in another building and then just run wires to the yeah. non-magnetic building and you know then we just you know tap into 12 volts i've often thought i ought to distribute 12 volts in my house <laughs> the distances aren't as extreme as what you're talking about so it yeah. would be i think practical you and thomas edison yeah <laughs> I, i'm not going to make it coal-fired though no <laughs> Steve, I figured it out if you open the participant uh, list up at the top, it shows raised hands. We've got oh, there it is. Two raised hands in
I see John's got something to say. I'm not hearing anything, though, from John, if you're speaking. Harold, it looks like you've got your hand up. Yeah, as usual, I have something more to say. Um, the uh, past 10 years and the increasing noise is the efficiency requirements have pretty much outlawed linear uh, wall warts. So um, they used to get warm and wasted a, a lot of power. Uh, and then uh, finally, I did put in chat a link to my uh, notes on power line noise. Oh, that's cool. Okay, well, if there's any more questions, if not, we'll wind it up. Uh, Steve, really appreciate it. Uh, very interesting. Very uh, well done. And uh, thank you for spending your time with us. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. And uh, you got a real nice active club. That's very cool. We've got a situation with one of our radio sites that we've got a six meter repeater. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there's a transmission line running right down the back of it. And we've been fighting that for for years. And uh, didn't affect the UHF stuff, but boy, it sure does six meters. And so we're at the point where we're uh, remoting a receiver to another site. And uh, is that a mountaintop site? It's on the side of a mountain. It's not a yeah. mountaintop, but it's uh, it's on the side of what's called Green Mountain. In Idaho, I had a lot of very uh, rural uh, wilderness kind of radio sites transmitting mostly, and but there would be receivers on the microwave, you know, receiving the signals to be broadcast. And uh, there was a lot of noise problems from power lines. Uh, I remember out in the desert in one part of Idaho, there was a place that for miles and miles, you just heard continuous roar on the AM broadcast band. And unfortunately, the power line followed the road. <laughs> so where the people were driving is where the noise was. And Idaho Power was not interested in dealing with that. They said, no one lives out there. Okay. But people drive there. So, Thank you very much for your presentation. Really appreciate it. I also like your e-loop on your spectrum analyzer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have one. Very minimalist, yeah. It has a ballon on it, too. I actually noticed that in the picture. I forgot I used that ballon. <laughs> Cable TV ballon. Yeah. But I wanted it to sort of be a probe that I could stick into the locations and and it wouldn't be picking up on the outside of the, of the coax too much. We've got a uh, pack, packet station at that same location, so you can... Uh, you can imagine what it does to it. We're mm -hmm. looking at uh, sometime in the future here to uh, relocate it also because it's, you know, it's just, uh, you're just fighting a losing battle. The, the pulses probably mess with the data more than, you know, you could tolerate it more on voices and things. But. Yeah, the noise floor is so high that, you know, runs S9 noise floor and just. It swamps out all the yeah. weaker signals. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Uh, if not. Real quickie uh, for Steve. Yeah. You are talking about uh, amidon and ferrite for cores and so forth. What's your opi uh, opinion of Palomo engineers in California? I They've been around for a long, long time. I think they know their stuff, but I haven't done business with them myself. So I, I don't know for sure. Um, but they certainly have been around a long time. I, in some cases, they were, I think, a dealer for Amadon stuff, I think. Maybe they were making uh, little kits and things out of the Amadon material. Yeah. Okay. DX Engineering also has uh, an RFI kit that gives you a bunch of ferrites. I've used it mostly to keep RF out of equipment, but uh, may be able to use it to keep the equipment from radiating also. Okay, thank you. Okay. Last, last call here. Anybody else? Well, if this. Uh,
begin the great presentation and uh, a great presentation and we'll uh, look forward to uh, maybe uh, hooking up with you again sometime all righty cool see you on the bands guys take care okay thank you very much seven three all yes thank you Where be the lead button? Okay, if there's nothing else, we're gonna shut her down. So, thanks everybody for participating. And uh, Tom, I see you waving. You guys take care. Stay well. Bye bye.